he asked if we could make a copy of this, and uh, he lives in the West Coast. So. All right, do you want to start with a happy birthday? Happy with... birthday, Sean. Everybody, happy birthday, Sean. Happy, happy birthday, birthday, Sean. Sean. All right. Okay. Uh, all right, so um, what you might expect uh, people to talk about if they talk about the Advaita Vedanta tradition, which is the oldest Vedic tradition uh, in Indian philosophy, uh, you might expect people to talk about the metaphysics uh, or what they believe about afterlife or something like that. And uh, I think that that would be doing you a disservice. Even though you would walk out of the room and you'd say, oh, I learned something about the relationship between Brahma and Atman, and I can, I can quote those expressions, and what does it mean to you? Uh, a lot less than the fact that you have to wear that, uh, that uh, hostel uh, shirt. Um, so what I'm going to do is give you something that will not give you. I have a friend, his name is Aaron, he's a math professor, very bright guy, and he said, I was talking to him about, what I'm, what's going on here today is different than teaching meditation. If I was teaching a meditation technique, and we were going to have two lectures, then you were going to get initiated in a meditation, then you were going to do three follow-ups, be a completely different talk. And my friend Aaron said, so really what your goal is at uh, this thing is to tell them what samadhi uh, is not, what samadhi being the experience we're going to focus on, you're going to tell them what count as mischaracterizations of that, and a little bit about why they're characterizations. So if the people leave the room, leave the room, the students leave the room thinking they've got a good grasp on the concept of samadhi, your lecture will have been a total failure. And the answer to that is yes. And that's not because there's some arrogance that I have or something like that about it. I mean, I may have arrogance, but not with respect to that. Uh, it's because it's almost impossible to talk about um, without mischaracterizing it. So what I'm going to do is, uh, first of all, point out why the metaphysical uh, analysis is not helpful and perhaps harmful, and then show you a kind of fancy alternative to that which I think you'll find, as philosophy students, you'll find interesting, then show you why that doesn't work. And then we'll have a hug and it'll be all over with. Okay, um, first of all, what we're going to be talking about <clears throat> is what's called samadhi. And there's a lot of quotes on this, on the notes I gave you, not only from Shankara and Maharishi, who were in the Advaita Vedanta tradition. <clears throat> Maharishi's master was what was called the Shankacharya of Jyotir Math, which means in a direct lineage from Shankara. Uh, so uh, there are quotes on here from people in that tradition, uh, but there's also quotes from uh, other traditions. And the reasons I put them on here is to try and bring to your mind the paradoxical nature. That's what I'm going to focus on, the paradoxical nature of samadhi. So first of all, let me read you a quote that Marish used to say to us frequently. It comes from the Upanishads and uh, ancient Vedic literature. Samadhi is known by nothing other than Samadhi itself. Samadhi is known by nothing other than, than nothing other than Samadhi itself. Now, the reason that that's immediately indicating a paradox is the following. Whenever we have any experience, whether it's sensory, intellectual, or emotional, we're conscious of something. Some object of perception or complex of objects of perception, I see this chalk so on and so forth. <clears throat> now, the attention that we have, the beam of attention that is focusing on the beam of attention being a beam of, a con of consciousness, focused consciousness, is attending to some object of perception or some group of objects of perception. Now, as we all well know, some objects of perception we enjoy and some we find unpleasant. Um, so we try to uh, engage in things that give us uh, happiness, wisdom, joy, and avoid things that give us pain. Uh, but as far as this goes, this, this subject for today, that doesn't matter. Any object of perception of any type, whether it be sensory, intellectual, emotional, or otherwise, has content. It has individuating content. It has specificity. So when I experience this, I'm not looking at a piece of red chalk, I'm looking at a piece of white chalk. When you have a certain emotion, it has certain attributes and lacks at other attributes. And that's true for every experience we've ever had. 
That is to say, every experience has a criterion that individuates it as being that experience. That's why the samadhi quote already indicates we're in paradoxical territory. Samadhi is known by nothing other than samadhi itself. Samadhi doesn't have a criterion. How can it be something that's an experience without a criterion? <clears throat> so, we're conscious of a series of objects of perception. People talk about enlightenment, lack of enlightenment, liberation, not non-liberation. What are they talking about? The basic idea, and all of this is metaphor, all this is to be taken lightly, but we'll get to the paradox in a few minutes. <clears throat> what that means is, when we experience the objects of perception, the thoughts we have, whether they're pleasant or not doesn't matter. When we experience those objects of perception, the nature of those objects of perception, not the specific nature as happy, sad, but the nature as having some individuation is what dominates our consciousness. A very poor metaphor, but not useless, would be you're sitting in a movie theater, uh, and you're in that movie theater your entire life, sometimes you're unconscious, that's like lights out. Let's forget dream state for a second. So when you're awake, you're conscious of different images on the screen. Now underlying or supporting the images is something that's different from the images. The images, picture of a car, a tree, people running, whatever. Those are the things we see, those are the things we pay attention to. But underlying or supporting them is the white screen. Now, this is where the metaphor breaks down, because the screen obviously has qualities every bit as much as the objects of perception. The only thing that fits is we're attending the objects of perception, not attending to the screen. But underlying the thoughts or objects of perception is consciousness, and although we always experience consciousness as focused in attention, it's possible to experience something called transcending which means we experience objects of perception fading, and as they fade, the consciousness does not fade, and eventually we gets to, one gets to a moment where one is conscious, but without object of perception. Now obviously you cannot experience that in any way that has attributes, like, oh my god, it transcended, because that would be a thought. So in retrospect, one will notice little gaps that are different from gaps one has when one falls asleep in extraordinarily subtle ways. Um, but that's, forget it, that's meditation. What's the benefit of doing it? The benefit is, outside of meditation time, the situation that is not optimal is the following. To have objects of perception, which are individuated, completely dominating our personhood when there is something else going on that is in many ways much more interesting, even though it's not a thing, and it's less remote from what it means to be an experiencer than even our ego or our sense of self, which is itself an object of perception. Uh, one may not believe that, but it, it is. And so what happens as a result of meditating months and months and years and whatever is eventually the intrinsic nature of objects of perception overshadow the intrinsic nature of consciousness, so life is very material in a sense. It's dominated by that individuation. What begins to happen is one has an experience of what's called witnessing, <clears throat> and that's a word that's used in many contexts, I know, but in this sense what witnessing means, in some sense, you're experiencing consciousness along with object and distinct from object of perception, uh, when you're in the waking state of consciousness. Now, that is one of the states of samadhi. There are different states that are called samadhi. Transcending is a state of samadhi. Witnessing is a state of samadhi. There are many, many of them. Dying is a state of samadhi, physical death. Uh, but we're going to think just about this one here. Now, the thing I want to emphasize is that this is contradictory that all of the literature on this is contradictory because on the one hand, one wants to say that one is experiencing it. Otherwise, what's the point? What are the monks sitting there for? When one is experiencing, this is no longer covered up by the objects of perception, one's having experience of witnessing. So in one sense, it's an ex something that's experienced, but 
it has no qualities whatsoever. It is not an object of perception itself. So what does it mean to experience it? And what you find is that in the literature and in the many quotes that I've given you, one runs into uh, paradox after paradox. Maharishi, in his commentary on the Bhagavad Gita, uh, after he's introduced this notion of witnessing, which is basically the goal of all the meditators, there's an expression. It's not on the level of thinking. Wait a minute. What could that possibly mean? It's not on the level of thinking. Everything's on the level of thinking. Another great teacher, Nisargadatta, read by many people who were in Maharishi's movement, his great, great insight. And he says things like this, all studies, including religious studies, which is all he was interested in, all your religious studies, all your spiritual studies, take place within the mind-body identification. What does that mean? What that means is they all studies, any evaluation, this lecture, anything else, is taking place on the level of thought. So how can it, and, and it's very clearly said here, witnessing is not on the level of thinking. <clears throat> Tawala Baba is an interesting guy. We get to question and answer. If you have any questions about him or Marsh, we could talk about that. He was the most sort of exotic, bad word to use, but the most exotic saint that I met in India. It's really hard to describe what this man is like. But at any rate, um, he was respected by everyone, including Buddhists, including uh, Catholic monks who were living there in their own, doing their own thing. Uh, a guy named Father Bede, for example, <coughs> one of the most respected. Um, they all said, this is a man. And here's what he says about witnessing. Or this is what he says about pure consciousness or being, a Brahman, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> Here's what he says about pure consciousness. It's not a thing one can experience. And yet, that's the whole point of meditating. So, <clears throat> first of all, any question at this point, and then I want to get into the attempts to evaluate it. Questions, thoughts. I was thinking at the beginning, I used to, anybody here ever hear, just a quick story, anybody ever hear of Andy Kaufman? God, my name is getting old. <laughs> anybody ever heard of the Beatles? Right. Uh, <clears throat> anybody ever heard of Bobby Orr? Uh, anyway, uh, Andy Kaufman was a comedian, very offbeat. If you don't know him, it won't be that funny. But something he might have done at the beginning, be invited to a class. And he might have started the pranayama and said, okay, just do it till I stop. And he might have gone on for the whole period just because that would have been funny. <laughs> and then walked out the door and said nothing. Um, anyway. All right, so there are, there are these paradoxes inherent. Paradoxes. Now, so I want to, uh, first of all, the, the standard approach, the standard metaphysical approach, which is going to say, okay, here's the standard approach to Advaita Vedanta. This being, Brahma, whatever you want to call it, this being which is unmanifested being, without differentiation, without principle, unborn, uncreated, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then there is the individual soul, which we would call it in the Christian tradition, uh, this Atman. And the thing is, one wants to create a connection between the Brahman and, and the Atman. One wants to create a, one wants, one wants to change the relationship of consciousness, pure consciousness, to uh, functioning attention. And you could do a whole metaphysics about that and creation and so on and so forth. Now, one of the troubles with that, one of the reasons I'm not doing that is it neglects the most important thing that has to be emphasized, that we're here talking about a paradox which is in some sense experienced. Now, let's say what it, so I'm going to say this is not the way to go. People want to do it, I have nothing against it, but you're missing something. And you're not paying attention, but you're pretending the paradox doesn't exist. Paradox is right in your face. Okay, there's a way of dealing with this. For about five minutes, I'm going to talk about a way of dealing with paradoxes. <clears throat> there's a guy named Graham Priest, good friend of mine, uh, who's a philosopher, and 
he's come up with a different way of dealing with paradoxes. First of all, <clears throat> whenever you have S, <clears throat> this is a law of logic that almost every philosopher uh, has supported in the past. People like Kant struggled with it. Should, is it right or is it not right? Um, Hegel's about the only guy who was uh, willing to let this principle go. What this principle says is, from a contradiction, you can prove anything. Uh, now, that was considered to be uh, sacrosanct by almost all philosophers, except a couple of pre-Socratics and Hegel, for the entire history of Western philosophy. Aristotle, everybody else. Now, today, that principle is thrown out by non-classical logics, which are basically taking over. And there's a practical reason. And that is, if you have uh, thousands of pieces of data, and logic is nothing but extract, uh, extracting information from other information, if your principles of logic include one that says, given a contradiction, you can prove anything. If you can prove anything, your system is useless. Because any, anything you do prove, whether you're doing work in physics or ethics or anything else, anything you prove, you can also prove the opposite, so it's useless. Uh, so, uh, if you have this principle, any contradiction that appears in your database uh, crashes your system. No good. Because inevitably paradoxes will arise if for no other reason than by mistake. By the way, one of the things that holding on to this principle means is that we have a gatekeeper of rationality. And for 2,000 plus years, people assumed there was a gatekeeper, and that was consistency. That is now very heavily thrown into doubt, and to be more honest about it, it is rejected by most of the people that are doing interesting work in logic. Um, <clears throat> so, now, it's one thing to say this principle is out uh, in order to avoid these kinds of practical problems. But these kind of problems, we could say, well, what that means is we're dealing with imperfect information. But nobody is saying that all these premises are true. It would be something much stronger to say, not only can our, we deal with contradictory information, but there may be some contradictions that obtain in reality. And this is what Graham Priest says. And the reason he says it is because, and we'll get back to the Eastern philosophy in a minute, there are many concepts <clears throat> that are called limit concepts that are necessary for any conceptualization, whether it be human or some other planet or whatever else, certain concepts that are absolutely central to our thinking. And infinity is one. Uh, the two biggies are sets, which just mean collections. It's not just something of interest in mathematics. Sets, what does it mean to talk about groupings of any kind? Set theory, truth, being, validity. Now, every single one of these concepts is provably inconsistent. There's no doubt about it. The liar paradox can be used to show that the concept of truth cannot be consistently defined. Um, the Russell paradox can be used to show that there is no set of all sets, and so on and so forth. So what does Graham Priest do with that? <clears throat> First of all, some people say these uh, arguments that give us the paradoxes, the Russell paradox, <clears throat> the liar paradox, uh, the Curry paradox, they must be faulty in some way. Now, if someone can come up with a unified explanation of all these paradoxes, that's extremely powerful. Bertrand Russell tried to do it and failed. Priest seems to have maybe succeeded, but in an odd way, not by saying that these paradoxes can be dissolved. He thinks they can't be. He thinks that the arguments, paradox, the arguments leading the paradoxes, are all valid. So what do the paradoxes give us? The paradoxes give us theses, things that we can prove, about impossible objects. So for him, the set of all sets, we're going to get a troublesome set called the Russell set. I'll talk about it in question and answer if you want. We're going to get a certain set that's going to cause trouble because it can be proven to be both within the set of all sets and also proven that it can't be in the set of all sets at the same time. And therefore, we have a contradiction. What Graham Priest says is we accept those contradictions 
We allow said theory, truth theory, and so on, to be inconsistent because this principle is no longer there. Now, what does this have to do with Eastern thought? Graham Priest is particularly interested in Eastern thought. He's a logician, but he's just written a new book called One, and it has to do with paradoxes back in Plato's time, has to do a little bit with his logic that he needs, uh, but mainly his interest is in Buddhist philosophy, mainly. And when he reads Buddhist philosophy and he reads the paradoxes of people like Nagarjuna, Shankara, the great intellect in the Advaita Vedanta tradition, Nagarjuna, the great intellect in the Buddhist tradition, when he reads these paradoxical sayings of someone like Nagarjuna, uh, he finds them even more interesting than the paradox of set theory and tooth theory. Now, why would that be? Well, because it's not that you're talking about impossible objects, it's like you're talking about impossible experiences, and yet experiences that some people have. Rather odd. Where do you think you're going? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I thought we could have a fight. He's a hockey player, isn't he? Is he pretending? He's pretending to be a hockey player. Anyway, it's all right, Charlie. Uh, yeah. so, um, so what Grand Priest says is that, now, I would submit to you that that analysis of Eastern thought is very superior to an analysis which simply neglects the paradoxes. Why? Not because I like paradoxes, but because paradoxes are at the very heart of this thing. We have it. We, the whole thing is to experience this witnessing, and yet witnessing is not on the level of thinking. That's a paradox. Experience not on the level of thinking, and then just rub wound, rub a little salt in the wound. All studies, all your religious studies, are basically on the level of thinking. Of course they are. Um, so, Nagarjuna's paradox comes to something like this, according to Graham Priest. He says, all things, uh, including emptiness itself, are empty. That is to say, all things, and what's important here is emptiness, and we can think of emptiness as being analogous to pure consciousness, because pure consciousness has no attributes, and isn't even manifested in a way that I'll indicate in a few minutes. So we can consider them at least roughly analogous. <clears throat> all things, including emptiness, or all things, including being, are empty. Being has no attributes, no doubt about that. They both have and lack, there's your contradiction, they have and lack a nature. Now, here's my little problem with Graham. I love Graham as a person. He's been very kind to the school that I teach at, very generous. He's clearly a giant intellect uh, and a lovely human being. But I can't accept this analysis of witnessing because it's unfaithful to the experience. Because what it gives us is a lesson. It gives us a lesson. There's something, this is supposed to be, honest to God, the ultimate word of Nagarjuna, who's got tons of paradoxes throughout his writing. And we have to play this against, uh, this is kind of like a dance we're doing here. I move in, you move back. Um, Nagarjuna says things like emptiness should be asserted, and at the same time, emptiness should not be asserted. Neither both nor neither should be asserted. Um, perhaps my favorite quote of Nagarjuna is this one, which must be kind of hard for Graham to swallow. Emptiness is proclaimed by the victorious ones, the enlightened. Emptiness is, is proclaimed by the victorious ones as, I love this expression, the refutation of all viewpoints. The refutation of all viewpoints. But those who hold emptiness as a viewpoint, the true perceivers have called incurable. Um, there, one of the responses a couple of responses to this. So the response here is basically saying we're taking the dialectic approach. We're not trying to give a consistent metaphysics. We, we agree that that misrepresents, violates the experience of samadhi, 
significantly. Uh, said, Graham would agree with that. But we come up with this, what he comes up with is paradoxes which are internally inconsistent and yet have information. Let me just back off for a second because that probably sounds strange to your ear. That is not in general impossible. There are many great works that have been written in the last decade, including Inconsistent Mathematics by Chris Mortensen, Inconsistent Geometry, and Inconsistent Set Theory by a guy named Zach Weber. Inconsistent Set Theory, which allows inconsistency, is much more profound than e either the old Set Theory that had a contradiction in it that people didn't notice, or the fixed up version, the kind of scrappled up version that came out that is consistent, but loses tremendous amount of the value of set theory. The inconsistent set theory does so. My point is, inconsistent claims can have explanatory value. They can do work, which people never thought that was possible. But they can't do this. They can't express what witnessing is, because witnessing is radically non-conceptual, non-perceptual. That's the whole point. Um, so, in response to Nagarjuna, if this is the ultimate truth, I would say, why do monks sit? Why do they have to sit anymore? If we've got this truth of all truths, front, printed on the front page of the Times, but obviously, that would be, it's ludicrous to say monks would stop sitting if they, even if this was somehow a profound interpretation of Nagarjuna. Would that mean that one wouldn't be trying to get to the emptiness, independent of getting to this? Let me stop for some questions and then say a few more things. But any any question? Okay, I have children. Then I had a, a kid who uh, was not my biological kid, but when he was about six years old, I became his sort of stepfather. And when he was six years old, I used to find that if he was going to, not going to cooperate, I would offer him a shiny dime. <laughs> <laughs> I am now offering a shiny dime to the first person who asks a question. It didn't have to be a good question. There must be some question here. Maybe you guys are in a different socioeconomic class than he was. <laughs> <laughs> the dime sits here. Yes, there we go. <laughs> Ready? There you go. Good catch. Excellent catch. I hope you got that. Um, yeah. So is his goal to figure out what emptiness means? or? You mean Graham's goal? Yeah. He would say yes. He would say yes, Seth, that he w does want to get to what emptiness means. And let's go back to set theory for a minute. I think it's fair to say that a... Dialethism is the view that there are two contradictions. Dialethism is the view where you say, for these big, huge contradictions here, we're going to go ahead and do our set theory, which is a very complex mathematical theory, acknowledging there's going to be a constraint in there because there's one principle called comprehension that leads to paradox. But we've got to have that principle. So Graham will say, okay, I am now going to tell you what set theory means, given the fact that you're going to allow me to have just a little bit of in inconsistency in there. Now, I think, to answer your question, he's trying to do the same thing with respect to being. The reason I'm offended by that is, to some extent, is that the whole nature of the experience of samadhi is that it's not on the level of thinking. That it can't be, in any sense, given any reduction to or articulation as a conceptual insight. Now, I think he thinks that, and he's sincere. And so, because I love the man, um, when you read these texts in Eastern thought that you're reading in this course, and the same goes for, obviously, for the Christian Bible and for other texts, um, they are written, obviously, to be read on many, many levels. And I'm not denying there is a level that might be of some interest to some people, not myself, uh, that is a metaphysical reading. And I'm also not denying that there might be 
the dialect, dialectic reading of particularly the Buddhist literature, and Graham has got something like nine or ten articles. They're beautiful. They're absolutely beautiful, worth reading. They're just not true. <laughs> That's the problem. Oh, let's put it this way. There's an interpretation of the experience that makes the experience literally infinitely, infinitely more interesting, which is not the one that he's getting to. But good question. I use that dime wisely. Don't, I don't want you spending on drugs, young lady. <laughs> uh, yes. No more dimes. <laughs> Achieving the witnessing or experiencing it, is that the same as enlightenment? And is that how you achieve moksha? The answer is, there are levels of enlightenment. And there are levels of, there are experiences beyond witnessing. And uh, I've read about them and heard about them. And uh, don't have anything to say about them. Uh, witnessing is, this is the stupidest thing I've ever said, things come into, when your head gets old, things come into it. Witnessing is kind of, you know the Lennon song, Working Class Hero? Witnessing is kind of a working class enlightenment. <laughs> it's kind of like, but it's enough. <laughs> it's enough. Because what it does is it shows the difference between experiencing thought and experiencing, in some bizarre sense, being or emptiness. Um, so the answer is, Roughly, yes, but there's a lot more that can count as witnessing. Let me give a story that might help sort of put some more on, on that question. <coughs> uh, we're in a place called Palgam, which is in uh, Kashmir, way, way up above the tree lines. Beautiful, beautiful place. And Palgam is supposed to be a very special place in that tradition. If you talk to people from India, especially older people, and you mentioned Palagam, even if they've never been there, they get moved by it, by the discussion. So we were there for a while, and uh, at the end of one day's lecturing, uh, somebody asked a question of Maharishi that went like this. Look, this is simple-minded, says the questioner, but let me pose a simple-minded question, and I'm sure it's a stupid question, but see what you have to say. <clears throat> In a sense, if we were to go into the metaphysics, we would say, at some time, there was no thing, no thing, nothing. Uh, there was nothing in creation, no minds, no, no physical stuff. And then creation comes about. And then human beings come about. And human beings have these amazing nervous systems. Then along with uh, all the other stuff that they can do creatively and destructively, they can also have a kind of self-reflexive experience that's called witnessing and maybe beyond that. Now, here's the question. The question is, there's a lot of suffering in the world. Buddhists emphasize that. Um, it's a lot of uh, travail and all of that. And furthermore, in both the Buddhist and the Vedic, when they talk about dying, the goal is to not be reincarnated. So if you get reincarnated, you're a loser, okay? Uh, and people talk about having many lives. People I know, people meditating 47, 50 years, we never talk about that. Uh, it's not part of our interests. Uh, but people do sometimes talk about that. So let's assume that being reincarnated is, is not what you want. Given all of this, you have this pure being, absolutely pure being. Then you have the impurity, as it were, of the world. And so the question is this. Why wouldn't it have been superior from an ultimate point of view, had the being never manifested into creation and the world of thoughts. And as he often did, he played with the question back and forth and teased and so on and so on. But then eventually he said, okay, the question is, why is it not unfortunate that being manifested into creation? And he said, the answer is it didn't. Now. It's tempting to see that as a metaphysical claim. It's not. It's a claim about witnessing. It takes a long... It, it emphasizes with like smack in the face that if you try to think of witnessing in terms of 
some phenomenological or conceptual or emotive criteria, you destroy it. Or at least you're not faithful to it. Is that a question? I'm hoping to get a question out of you. That's mainly why I came here. It was a rough ride, young man. It really was. Yes, here we go. I think a witness would be considered like a samsara. I'm getting like confused just because it's saying that when we're born, obviously we have like a pure, we're pure. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, you're a baby, you haven't done anything wrong yet. Yeah. And, but then when you learn about like, I'm in Buddhism too, and when we learn about sam, like samsara, mm -hmm. we're like <laughs> continuously in this cycle because of your previous consciousness and right. your previous like acts of like positives and negatives, and then the goal is to cancel it out completely in right. order to reach enlightenment. Right. But my question is, like, does that mean that we're considered coming in as, like, innocent beings, but then witness kind of, of, like, this, like, you're, you're born into a world where you have, un, like, a lot of opportunities to either do good things or bad things. So would witnessing be a considered samsaric or...? No, no. Witnessing would be kind of an es at least a temporary escape from that. I mean, you could say... In terms of the pureness, um, well, let me take another angle and then come back to you. What about ego loss, which is a big deal in Eastern philosophy and isn't talked about as much in Maharishi's Transcendental Meditation, but it's there. Because the ego is part of, it's an organizing principle, and it's a conditioned principle. Each person has a different ego because they have different conditioning and so on and so forth. Um, there comes a point when one can cognize the ego as being a, you think of your external history, the town you were born in and the place you go to college as being somewhat external to yourself. It, you know, you did it and it's part of you, but, but then there's this more intimate thing that's kind of integrating all of that. Well, that integrator, the ego, can also be experienced as a thing, a construct. Now, in answer to your question, I think the best way to make the metaphor would be the, uh, the, the consciousness of the child, or the consciousness of anyone, before they separate these two guys, is in a state of uh, impurity, if you like. So what you have to do is isolate this guy. And there's actually a physiological correlate of it. You have to isolate this guy. And then you can experience consciousness and object of perception together. Does that help a little bit? There's another thing that your question makes me think about, and that is this. One of the things that I want to emphasize is that uh, the experience of samadhi itself um, is radically unlike what we normally call experience, and it seems, and it is paradoxical to even refer to it as an experience. Um, but also, as far as techniques go, when you practice a technique, you do something, whatever it is. Some people watch the breath, some people do this, some people, Zen monks will sometimes meditate with their eyes open and do one thing or another thing. There's a, a number of, of techniques. Um, I think a good, for me it seems clear that, we're, what are we working with? We're working with our attention. That's what we've got to play with. That's what we're always studying as that and playing as that. Different ways we work with our attention. Some things relax the attention, some things focus the attention. Now. When you get instructions in meditation, in any technique whatsoever, some of the, sometimes those instructions are completely manageable within and are completely faithful to the intuitions and definitions that we have for attention. I would submit that's not true with TM. And I would submit that anything that described the goal of life in terms of things that are not breaking radically with expectations and conceptual background may not be as interesting as something that does and as far as technique goes if the technique can be analyzed in terms of the standard understanding of what attention is because we're experiencing attention all the time but when a person is witnessing, attention is redefined. 
Now, before you get to that witnessing, you've got something you're doing when you're sitting meditating in your little chair. And the question is, if you properly understand those instructions, which in the case of TM are not like following a rule and cannot be like following a rule, then what are they? And what you're doing with a person after they get initiated is kind of disabusing them of the tendency to analyze their internal experiences in a way that we've analyzed every other experience up to that point. Good questions. Any other questions from uh, this side of the room? This side of the room is getting its, uh, it's, it's getting, it's losing. And this side of the room. <laughs> well, you're like Zen monks. I don't expect you guys to talk. Uh, any other thoughts, questions? Hey, Charlie. Yes. We're out of time. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a question? <laughs> no, that's an assertion. That's a reality. That's not an emptiness. Is it a consistent reality? Yes. Like most of them. In this universe. Right. In this universe. All right, let us thank uh, Professor Donahue for this enlightening lecture. And thank you very much. Thanks so much, and happy birthday, Sean. Yeah. <laughs>